Hi class, this is Professor Mahan. I'm sorry I can't be there on Monday. Um, however, we're gonna do a lecture on 5.3 via YouTube. So 5.3 is on the fundamental theorem of calculus. So I had foreshadowed this on Wednesday saying that this is the shortcut to finding the area under the curve. There are two parts to the fundamental theorem of calculus. I'm gonna include the worksheet um, to this Facebook message, so make sure you print out the worksheet and fill in the blanks as you follow along with the lecture. So part one and part two of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Um, part two is gonna be the main application of it, but we still need to know part one as well, but they are related. So in part one, suppose f, the function, is continuous on the closed interval a through b. So remember, a lot of the functions that we do, everything has to be continuous, meaning you draw a curve without ha having to pick up your pen. Now, capital F of X is what, remember if you remember on Wednesday, capital F of X is what we consider the antiderivative. So let capital F of X equal to the integral from A to X, those are the endpoints, the antiderivative of the function F of X or I'm sorry, f of t. Let me say this is f of t dt. The reason why I'm using t instead of x is because the endpoint has an x in it, so I'm trying to use a different variable. So if those two conditions are met, one is continuous, and secondly, that the antiderivative is such, then you can conclude three things using this theorem. The first part is that the antiderivative is also continuous on a, b. So in other words, you could draw a picture of the function without having to pick up your pen. Second part is the capital F of X or the antiderivative is also differentiable on open interval A through B. I hope you guys are beginning to see the pattern that these two conclusions are very similar to the mean value theorem that we had in the previous test. And then the third condition is that, or the third conclusion, is that the derivative of the antiderivative is going to be the original function, hence the name antiderivative against. So the derivative of the antiderivative is the derivative. So let me restate this in layman's term. So the restatement of fundamental theorem of calculus part one is that the derivative of the antiderivative written as such is equal to the original function. All right, so before I go on to the second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus, let me do a few examples so you can see how this is played out. Hi class, this is Professor Mahan. I'm sorry I can't be there on Monday. Um, however, we're gonna do a lecture on 5.3 via YouTube. So 5.3 is on the fundamental theorem of calculus. So I had foreshadowed this on Wednesday, saying that this is the shortcut to finding the area under the curve. There are two parts to the fundamental theorem of calculus. I'm gonna include the worksheet um, to this Facebook message, so make sure you print out the worksheet and fill in the blanks as you follow along with the lecture. So part one and part two of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Um, part two is gonna be the main application of it, but we still need to know part one as well, but they are related. So in part one, suppose f, the function, is continuous on the closed interval a through b. So remember, a lot of the functions that we do, everything has to be continuous, meaning you draw a curve without ha having to pick up your pen. Now capital F of x is what, remember if you remember on Wednesday, capital F of x is what we consider the antiderivative. So let capital F of x equal to the integral from a to x, those are the endpoints, the antiderivative of the function f of x, or I'm sorry, f of t, let me say this is f of t dt. The reason why I'm using t instead of x is because the endpoint has an x in it, so I'm trying to use a different variable. So if those two conditions are met, one is continuous, and secondly, that the antiderivative is such, then you can conclude three things using this theorem. The first part is that the antiderivative is also continuous on a, b. So in other words, you could draw a picture of the function without having to pick up your pen. Second part is the capital F of x or the antiderivative is also differentiable 
on open interval A through B. I hope you guys are beginning to see the pattern that these two conclusions are very similar to the mean value theorem that we had in the previous test. And then the third condition is that, or the third conclusion is that the derivative of the antiderivative is going to be the original function, hence the name antiderivative against. So the derivative of the antiderivative is the derivative. So let me restate this in layman's term. So the restatement of fundamental theorem of calculus part one is that the derivative of the antiderivative written as such is equal to the original function. All right, so before I go on to the second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus, let me do a few examples so you can see how this is played out. Hi class, this is Professor Mahan. I'm sorry I can't be there on Monday. Um, however, we're gonna do a lecture on 5.3 via YouTube. So 5.3 is on the fundamental theorem of calculus. So I had foreshadowed this on Wednesday saying that this is the shortcut to finding the area under the curve. There are two parts to the fundamental theorem of calculus. I'm gonna include the worksheet um, to this Facebook message. So make sure you print out the worksheet and fill in the blanks as you follow along with the lecture. So part one and part two of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Um, part two is gonna be the main application of it, but we still need to know part one as well, but they are related. So in part one, suppose f, the function, is continuous on the closed interval a through b. So remember, a lot of the functions that we do, everything has to be continuous, meaning you draw a curve without ha having to pick up your pen. Now, capital F of x is what, remember if you remember on Wednesday, capital F of x is what we consider the antiderivative. So let capital F of x equal to the integral from a to x, those are the endpoints, the antiderivative of the function f of x, or I'm sorry, f of t. Let me say this is f of t dt. The reason why I'm using t instead of x is because the endpoint has an x in it, so I'm trying to use a different variable. So if those two conditions are met, one is continuous, and secondly, that the antiderivative is such, then you can conclude three things using this theorem. The first part is that the antiderivative is also continuous on a, b. So in other words, you could draw a picture of the function without having to pick up your pen. Second part is the capital F of x or the antiderivative is also differentiable on open interval a through b. I hope you guys are beginning to see the pattern that these two conclusions are very similar to the mean value theorem that we had in the previous test. And then the third condition is that, or the third conclusion is that the derivative of the antiderivative is going to be the original function, hence the name antiderivative against. So the derivative of the antiderivative is the derivative. So let me restate this in layman's term. So the restatement of fundamental theorem of calculus part one is that the derivative of the antiderivative written as such is equal to the original function. All right, so before I go on to the second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus, let me do a few examples so you can see how this is played out. All right, so the next page of your worksheet should have four examples. Um, this is straight out of your homework um, with a few slight changes, but if you could do these four problems, you should be good to go on your homework. The first problem has the antiderivative of this, and it says use the fundamental theorem of calculus part one to solve this. I wrote the fundamental theorem of calculus part one here on the side, so the derivative of the antiderivative is equal to f of x. And notice the upper and lower bounds are from a to x, meaning the left-hand endpoint and the right-hand endpoint. So number one, it looks just like the formula that I just wrote on the right-hand side. So it's from a through x, and here's the function dt. So if I wanna find the derivative of this, okay? So 
or I'm sorry, if I want to find the derivative of this, so they're asking me to find the derivative, so g prime of x, so I should have written that the instruction is to find the derivative using fundamental theorem of calculus part one. So the derivative of this function, so the derivative of this function, so I'm just gonna rewrite the fundamental theorem of calculus, is gonna equal to the original function, but now instead of the letter t, we're gonna use the variable x instead. So I just rewrite it with x minus x to the sixth to the third power, and that's your answer. So using the fundamental theorem of calculus part one is actually pretty straightforward. You just rewrite the function, but with an x in it. And the only requirement is that it goes from a through x. If you notice in number three and four example, it does not go from a through x. So we'll, I'll show you what to do with that. All right, the next problem, find the, find the derivative. So to find the derivative of this top function, so I'm gonna rewrite it. To find the derivative of this top function, again, using the fundamental theorem of calculus part one, you just rewrite that function, but with the letter x in it. And that's as long as it's going from a through x. a is just a number, so we have one here. So a represents a number, so one through x. So that's a okay, it meets the fundamental theorem of calculus form, so therefore that's my answer. Easy peasy, let's make it a little bit harder. Let's go ahead and find the derivative of this function. So here I have taking the derivative of this top function here, so I'm just rewriting it. Taking the derivative of this function, notice that the boundaries are going from x to zero. However, my formula is saying it's going from a number to x. So here it's backwards. You guys see that? So here it's going from x to zero, and here it's going from a through x. So you need to make it look like this in order to use the fundamental theorem of calculus part one. So to go from a number to x, if I switch these around, if I put the zero on the bottom, the x on top, I just simply have to put a negative in the front. So here I'm gonna take the derivative of the negative, so I'm gonna put this in brackets, the negative version, and I'm gonna switch the x and the zero to zero and x, root seven plus secant three t dt. Since I switch it around, that's a-okay, all I need to do is put a negative, I now apply the fundamental theorem of calculus, I get seven plus secant three, instead of putting t, I use the letter x, and then that is my final answer. So number three, the only difference with number one and two, again, is that these boundaries were quote unquote backwards. So to flip it over, you, you just stick a negative in the front. All right, last but not least, number four. So now I'm gonna make it a little bit harder. Notice that the boundaries are from five, which is okay, it says constant, to tangent x. Now tangent x is not the variable x, it's tangent x, so it's a function. So since it's a function, we're gonna have to use a chain rule. So what do I mean by that? Okay, let me take the derivative of this. I'm gonna rewrite this as take the derivative of five to tangent x of the function. All right, <clears throat> so I'm gonna take the derivative of this thing. So it's, it's somewhat in the form of this, meaning it's a, a to x, so it's five to some function of x. So when I take the derivative of this, I get three x plus root x right, using the fundamental theorem of calculus. However, because the top boundary is tangent x instead of x, remember, we need to use a chain rule. So if I took the derivative of this thing, I take the derivative of it, I get this. However, using the chain rule, I also need to use take the derivative of tangent x. Technically speaking, we did that in number one and two and three. When we take the derivative of x, what's the derivative of x? just one, but I didn't have to write it out, right? Because multiplying by one is redundant. So in this problem, the derivative of tangent x is secant squared x. So I'm gonna multiply this by secant squared x. So again, that's using the chain rule. So whenever you're taking the derivative of an antiderivative, the answer is just the function itself, but with the letter x, and remember that the boundaries goes from a number to a function.
So a number to a function. And if it's not a number to a function, if you switch it upside down, you get a negative. And then lastly, if your function is something complicated looking like tangent x, you'll need to use a chain rule and multiply the derivative by the derivative of tangent x. And that, my friends, is your final answer. All right, so let's go ahead and go back to the fundamental theorem of calculus. We just went over part one. We did four examples, and now we're going to go to part two. So there's only two parts to this, by the way. So part two of the fundamental theorem of calculus, notice I put a star next to it, because this is actually what we're going to mainly use the fundamental theorem of calculus for. So this is the main part. And what we do here in this class will will also, or what we learn in this section about fundamental theorem of calculus will also pertain to calculus two and calculus three. So really, really make sure that you understand this part. All right, and if not, make sure you um, um, go get tutoring. The Mass Success Center has a bunch of workshops available for this section. So part two says let F, suppose F is, again, same condition as always, F is continuous on the closed interval A through B. So it has endpoints. Now let blank is any antiderivative for F of X. So I said capital F of X, right? So capital F is the antiderivative for F. So the conclusion, the conclusion is what we kind of had up here. The conclusion is that the then the derivative of the antiderivative is just the original function itself. All right, so the implication. So that's something that we already know. So what does this imply? So what this implies is, if you remember when we talk about the antiderivative, we're actually talking about the area underneath a curve. And in 5.2, 5.1 and 5.2, we did the long ass method of using the limit of the Riemann sum to find the area under the curve. So here we get to do the shortcut. So the shortcut is using the antiderivative. So the area under the function or the curve, f of x from a to b, so it has to be a closed interval, is, here's the notation for antiderivative. And if you have endpoints, what you're gonna do is gonna find the antiderivative, and then you're gonna plug in b, Oh shoot, I ran out of ink, sorry. Um, then you're gonna plug in B minus, so the antiderivative with B plugged in minus the antiderivative with A plugged in. So that's super duper important. So I am going to box that in with a pen that does not work. Okay, so that's really, really important. This is the fundamental theorem of calculus where capital F of X is any antiderivative of F. So to find the area under a curve, we no longer need to use the limit of the Riemann sum. whoop de doo that's a good news because remember that took about a whole page to do and here we could solve it within a few lines. So we just need an antiderivative. Okay, so go ahead and fill in the blanks for that. Um, in the next video, I am going to do some examples on part two of the fundamental theorem of calculus. So this is my last video for chapter 5.3. We just learned about the fundamental theorem of calculus part two, and now there are four examples. First example, you have the antiderivative with the endpoints from negative one to two of this function. So to find the antiderivative, right? So remember you add one to the exponent and you divide by the new exponent. If I add one to the exponent, I get four. Divide by the new exponent, I get one fourth on the outside. Minus, I have 4x, I'm going to add 1 to the exponent, I get x squared, and I divide by the new exponent. So 4 divided by the new exponent, 4 divided by 2 is 2. And if I were you, I would always check my work before I continue on, because you don't want to go through all this work and then find out you made some small error. Take the derivative of this. If you take the derivative of this, you should get back the original function, because the derivative of the antiderivative is the original function. I hope I'm sounding like a broken record because I am being a broken record by saying that. So take the derivative of this and you should be able to get the original function. So stop what you're doing and check your work before you continue on. All right, but notice I have endpoints. If I did not have endpoints, I would put plus C. But since I have endpoints, 
I'm gonna re I'm gonna put the endpoints at the end like this. I put a line, so this is a no notation. You put a line through and you say from negative one to two because that signifies that you are going to be using the fundamental theorem of calculus. So remember the fundamental theorem of calculus says this. Okay. Now that you have the antiderivative, you're gonna plug in B minus plug in A. So remember B is the top and A is the bottom. So when I plug in B in here, so I'm gonna just Put this in brackets so it could be super duper clear. So this is gonna be f of b, and this is gonna be f of a. And remember, this is my f, my capital F function. This is the antiderivative. The antiderivative is this. I'm gonna plug in two into this function, and when I plug in two, that's my f of b. Minus, I'm gonna plug in negative one into the antiderivative, and that'll be f of a. So I'm gonna find f of two minus f of negative one. So go ahead and do the math for that. One fourth times two to the fourth minus two, two squared. Minus one fourth times negative one to the fourth minus two, negative one squared. Um, I don't have the answers on me, but I'll, I'll show the answer in um, another worksheet. So, but that's the, the gist of it. That's how far I want you guys to get. And then the rest is just algebra. Plug that into your calculator, right? But just be really careful with the sign. All right, so let's try three other examples using the same thing. So here I have the antiderivative of this. The first thing I'm gonna do is find the antiderivative. So step one, step one, find the antiderivative. Capital F of X. So I'm gonna rewrite this integral of one to nine, the square root of x, to make my life easier, I'm gonna rewrite this with exponents because I don't like working with radicals. So I'm gonna get x to the one half dx. To find the antiderivative, so remember you add one to the exponent, then you divide by the new exponent. So one half plus one will give me one and a half, which is three half. And then I divide by the new exponent. Well, if you divide by three half, it's the same thing as multiplying by the reciprocal. So again, when you're dividing by a fraction, it's the same thing as multiplying by the reciprocal. So three half, the reciprocal of three half is two third. If I did not have endpoints, I would put a plus C and be done with the game. But because I do have endpoints one and nine, I'm gonna put this line right here and I remind myself it goes from one to nine. So again, this is my capital F of X. So step two, is to apply the fundamental theorem of calculus. So when I apply this, I'm gonna do f of b minus f of a. Well, what is b? b is the top number nine. And what is a? a is the bottom number one. So in other words, I'm gonna do f of nine minus f of one. In other words, I'm gonna get, uh, and I'm running out of space, sorry, two third times nine to the three half minus two third times one to the three half, right? And then go ahead and do the calculation for that. That's just algebra work. So I'll let you guys figure that part out, but that's the gist of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Part B, let's do this again. And notice each one of these problems I'm doing is getting harder and harder. First, it just started off with a polynomial, then it has a radical, so you gotta make it look like an exponent. Now you have a function times another function. Holy smokers, what do you do with that? And look at part C, I have fractions in here. What do I do with that one? All right, so part B, don't be afraid. The first thing you do is you find the antiderivative. But this is kind of ugly looking. Let's go ahead and make it look pretty. Let's simplify it before you find the antiderivative, right? So work smarter, not harder. Make it look simple before you find the antiderivative. So I'm just gonna multiply this out using FOIL. So long story short, I get u squared minus u minus six du. Now that it looks nice and pretty, I could find the antiderivative. Finding the antiderivative, I add one to the exponent and divide by the new exponent. So I get one third u to the third. I'm going a little bit faster now, minus Add one to the exponent, I get u squared, multiplied by one half, minus 
remember this is kind of like u to the zero power. If you add one to the exponent, you get u to the first power. Divide by one, so it'll just be six. And again, always make sure to check your work before going on. Take the derivative of this and you should get the original function. All right, so now I'm gonna put this line here to remind myself that I need to apply the fundamental theorem of calculus. So when I plug one and zero in, I'm gonna do f of one minus f of zero. So if I plug one in here, so one is an easy number to plug in, right? So thank God, Plus, press one, plug in one, I get one third minus one half minus six. Close the bracket. Minus, open bracket, plug in zero. Zero minus zero minus zero is just zero. And go ahead and do the math with that. Okay, so you'll end up getting a number as a result. Last but not least, part C. Again, holy smokers, look at this one. This one looks really complicated. You can't find the antiderivative as is. So let's make it look pretty before you find the antiderivative. So it's a rational function. So I'm gonna split this up into two fractions, v to the fifth. I put v to the fifth over v to the fifth plus four v eighth over v to the fifth. Simplify the fraction, I get one plus four v to the third dv. So notice this looks a lot more prettier. Okay, next step is find the antiderivative. The antiderivative of one is just um, v. Antiderivative of this is um, four or v to the fourth, and the four divided by four is just one. Okay, then I go from one to two, plug this in, I get f of two minus f of one. So when I plug two into the function, here's f of two minus f of one. If I plug two into this function, I get two plus two to the fourth, minus I plug in one into the function, I get one plus one to the fourth. So again, you could do the math to figure that part out. All right, <clears throat> so quick review. All four examples that we did here, once you get the answer, you'll get a number result for a, b, c, and one, a, b, and c. And the reason why you get a number as an answer is because the application of the fundamental theorem of calculus is that it's the area underneath a curve. The area underneath a curve is always a finite number. So again, or not a finite number, just a number. So that's why you will get an answer for one, A, B, and C in terms of a number. If you have any questions on any part of this video, feel free to Facebook message me or put a question on our Facebook class page and either your classmates or our SI Carl or myself will be happy to help you.